A few weeks ago, I released a comparison video on different types of salts. I thought I knew a lot about salts, but man, I learned a lot more. One kind viewer commented about the significant amount of microplastics that are found in sea salts. I wasn't even aware that there was an issue with that. See, when I was doing my research for salts, there wasn't even a mention of microplastics in any of the Google results. You know what? He wasn't the only viewer that made mention that microplastics were found in sea salts. What I learned? Microplastics should not be ignored. I want to eat healthy, do what I can now, so this way I can spend my golden years gardening instead of going from doctor appointment to doctor appointment. And you know what, if that happens, so be it. But at least I could say that I did everything in my power to prevent it from happening. I want to share with you what I learned because I watch people who I love in my life doing the fastest and most convenient thing, and that's not always what is the best and healthiest choice. You know, like today, I just wanna to make a healthy salad. In the summer, I can go to any number of local farm stands and get whatever I need for a salad, and it's handed to me without any packaging. But in the winter, I go to a club warehouse to get the most affordable organic produce I could find. I mean, look at how much plastic these vegetables are packed in. But are these plastics bad for us? How much of this is actually making it into the food chain? And does it really matter? According to Greenpeace International, 90% of all sea salts contain microplastics in them. Got me thinking, well, what other foods have microplastics in them? In a paper I found on Science Direct, the dominant food source that contains microplastic is shellfish and fish that are found in salt waters. Out of the 25 species, 11 were found to contain microplastics. And in a blog post on Greenpeace International's website, apples had one of the highest microplastic counts in fruit, with an average of 195,500 plastic particles per gram, while pears averaged around 189,500 plastic particles per gram. Broccoli and carrots were shown to be the most contaminated vegetables, averaging more than 100,000 plastic particles per gram. This could be organic lettuce, but this does not have an organic rating on it. Fortunately, it's 100% recyclable, but I've seen containers that do not have a low number in their recyclability. One of the greatest sources of microplastics happens to be in the bottled water that we drink, but does it really affect us? I'm here with Chris Pickerel. He's the Marine Program Director for Co Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. Thank you so much for, for helping me out with this. I'm glad to be here with you today. No problem. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, I want to find out a little bit more. I'm doing some research on microplastics and I wanted to find out, uh, I want to get your perspective on it. And um, I understand that there is growing concern that a lot of people who feel that microplastics are really an environmental issue that needs to be addressed. And I kind of want to get your, your take on that. As you might imagine, it's not something that's new, but as you pointed out, it's something that is kind of new to our consciousness. So We've been using plastics for almost like 100 years now, at least, you know, 75 years. So there's always been plastics in the environment, but it's only now that we're kind of coming to understand how they're getting into the environment and contaminating things. And when you bring up microplastics and what I'd like to talk about as well, uh, nanoplastics, even more difficult to get a sense of. So what we're talking about is um, the large debris that uh, originates from waste from our homes or from our automo automobiles or what have you getting into the, our surface waters and then breaking up into really small pieces. And when that happens, these float around and can get consumed by waterfowl and wildlife and what have you. And there are issues with that in that these very small um, particles actually attract contaminants. So that's kind of the problem. It gets into the food chain, into the food web and can bioaccumulate over time. So that's what we're thinking about. And then the form of nanoplastics, the concern obviously would be more like with shellfish and mollusks and, and proto, 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 proto is that what yeah, say? yeah, zooplankton, phytoplankton, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, so um, the nanoplastics uh, are very, very small. They're invisible basically to the naked eye. So they can be taken up by any of a number of things. So things that are lower down in the food chain can consume them and then they get eaten by the larger things and, you know, right on up through that food chain. So the issue there is that the smaller the size, the, <clears throat> the higher the actual surface area, so there can be more contamination. But in and of themselves, they're kind of biologically inert. They don't do anything, but it's what they attract to them that's the problem. But certain animals and organisms are able to filter them out. So you think of like shellfish, especially oysters, are able to 
they may take them up to a certain extent, but they expel them through their feeding process. So they don't really concentrate them in, in any large numbers, if at all. So that's kind of interesting in that regard. Other things, uh, they can actually cause blockage to their digestive system. So it's kind of a physical barrier or something that, that's entrained within their bodies, but it depends on the species and how their, their feeding apparatus works. So we really need to be very conscious about the plastics that we're using and, how, and what's happening with them. I mean, I, I know that in the restaurant, especially in Suffolk County, we spend a lot of time, like Suffolk County Health Department won't allow us to have plastic straws on, on demand. Like you have to ask yeah. for them. And, you know, my restaurant, I only use, uh, you know, biodegradables like cane sugar products. I'm, like, I'm glad that's happening. But, you know, I read a, 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 an article in the National Geographic that 91% of all plastics don't even get recycled. I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind yeah, of crazy. It's, it's and one of the things is in terms of talking about micro nanoplastics is that a lot of it comes from things like our clothes. Uh -huh. So all these stretchy materials we have, that's all those plastics that are in them. So every time you wash your clothes or bring it to the laundry, it's getting into that wastewater. Now, in many cases on the island, that's going into the ground and it doesn't really move through the ground in any, any you know, uh, in any high concentration because it gets trapped by the sand in this case. But for areas where there are sewage treatment plants, a lot of times it will pass through to a certain extent. So the, the filaments you're seeing in the ocean are from a lot of from our clothes, believe it or not, it's not just the containers and the things that we're using. Wow. Wow. So, uh, well, this is something that needs to be addressed. And I'm hoping that uh, people are going to take it a little bit more seriously and hopefully start resorting to, you know, things like hemp clothing or cotton, the way things used to be, um, wool. Uh, but I, I look, I know you're a busy man and I really don't want to take up more of your time, but I can't thank you enough for taking the time to meet with me today. I want to wish you all the best and, uh, you know, keep me posted if, if there's anything I can do or anything that you would like me to add to a future video, send it my way. No problem. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. And, uh, see you again soon. Thank you so much. Be well. Even though there is no direct correlation with the effect of microplastics on humans in scientific studies right now. There is global concern about microplastics. Since 2015, plastic fragments in food products have been cited as contaminants in the European Commission's Rapid Alert System for Food and Feeds portal and on the European Food Safety Authority's website. All of the links that I reference here today, all the papers, all the websites are listed down below. According to a study titled Plastic in Human Health, a Micro Issue, although microplastics in human health is an emerging field, complementary existing fields indicate potential particle chemical and microbial hazards. If inhaled or ingested, microplastics may accumulate and exert localized particle toxicity by inducing or enhancing an immune response. Chronic exposure is expected to be of greater concern because of the accumulation of microplastics that could occur in our bodies. Plastic manufacturing involves chemicals, some of which are less harmful than others, some of which are more harmful than others. According to a paper titled Marine Litter Plastics and Microplastics in the Toxic Chemical Components, the Need for Urgent Preventative Measure, it has been estimated that the global quantity of plastic in the ocean will nearly double to 250 million tons by 2025. <laughs> Look, I'd like to assume that nowadays plastic manufacturers are being more selective and careful about the chemicals that they use in the manufacturing process. But from my history, I've seen that a lot of these chemicals are really harmful and we don't find out about them until they've been in use for years. In 2019, a paper was published titled Interaction Between Microplastics and Microorganisms as well as Gut Microbia. Floating microplastics can block the absorption of sunlight by the phytoplankton in the ocean which in turn affects their ability to provide food and oxygen for marine life. What really is concerning to me is that these microplastics, they find their way in with microalgae to become a food source for a lot of marine life. They have a series of adverse effects on marine animals, including invertebrates such as zooplankton and vertebrates such as fish, amphibians, and seabirds. The effect on zooplankton could be blockage in the digestive tract. It could be a loss of appetite, which leads to malnutrition and the signs of slow growth and even death. Mercury levels in smaller species of fish like sardines and anchovies was never a problem because they consumed plankton. Now we're finding that they're microplastics present in sardines. 
Studies have shown that through agricultural plastics, microplastics have affected soil microorganisms. Look, it's important to note that right now there aren't enough studies to show exactly how harmful microplastics are to humans, but there is growing concern that these microplastics are affecting all forms of life. I'm really curious to see something here in the form of ratio between food to plastic in these containers. Here we have 277 grams of lettuce. I'm gonna zero that back out. I just wanna weigh the container. The container weighs 62 grams. So if you take the weight of the plastic and divide it by the weight of the lettuce, 22% of that packaging is plastic. I'm guilty of throwing out these thin, flimsy plastic bags that you would normally put your vegetables in when you go to the supermarket. You know, the good thing is that these have a recyclable number of two, but I don't know how much of that is actually getting recycled. We're living in a fast-paced world and we need to save as much time as possible. Look, we have to be more selective about the products that we use, even more aware of the products that we purchase. For example, in my restaurant, I only use sugarcane based to-go containers. And with the advent of technology and the demand, plastic straws and plastic forks and knives, which are really, really cheap, are being replaced with biodegradable plastic ware, which is becoming more and more affordable, thankfully. But what about that video I released about salt? The link to that is up here and down below in the description. Thankfully, it kind of reaffirmed something I believed in all along. According to a study published in 2018 titled Global Pattern of Microplastics in Commercial Food Grade Salts, a total of 39 salt samples were sourced from 21 countries, 28 sea salts, nine rock salts, and two lake salts. Only three brands of salts did not contain any microplastics, including my favorite, French gray salt, or Celtic sea salt. Again, video not sponsored. Now that I'm aware of microplastics, I realized that I was wrong. Not all sea salt makes good table salt. So many of you made comments about this salt mined in Utah. It's Redmond's real salt. So I ordered it from Amazon and it tastes amazing. It's unrefined and most importantly, does not contain microplastics. You made mention in the comments as well about how mine salts are probably better for you than sea salt because mine salts were never exposed to the toxins that we poured into our waters over the past century. Although this is partially true, you gotta be careful because not all mine salts are equal. According to a paper published in 2010, Iranian rock salt contains unhealthy levels of heavy metals. Iran has banned the use of rock salt for human consumption. I gained a lot of respect for Redmond Salts. They were not afraid to even promote other salt brands that were healthy for you. They actually put a video out and a blog post and the link to that is down below in the description. Guess what? They like Celtic Sea Salt and Himalayan Salt. So I've added Redmond Salt to my list of favorite salts, not only because it's free from microplastics and mine with care, it's really delicious. One viewer suggested that Himalayan salt contain traces of radioactive elements. They shared a link to a website article talking about it. In that article was a link to a spectral analysis of Himalayan pig salt and most of the radioactive elements were less than one thousandth of a part per million. Even though it's an insignificant amount, I wanted to find out if one thousandth of one part per million is considered dangerous. In a paper published in 2019 titled Food Salt Characterizations in Terms of Radioactivity and Metal Contamination, nine salts were tested in terms of radioisotopes and metal contamination. Now, assuming that the average person eats about 10 grams of salt per day, that's 17 and older, annually we consume about 3.65 kilograms of salt. The obtained annual effective dose is under allowable levels. There is no risk of ionizing radiation effects on humans. Human beings are subject to radiation coming from natural and artificial sources in their living environments, including natural radioactivity in the presence of our radionuclides in the Earth's crusts. Global nuclear tests performed in the 1940s and 80s, along with nuclear accidents. And unfortunately, through a lot of the food that we eat, especially depending on where we live, but not only in salt. So getting back to my original question, how much microplastic should we eat? We really have to ask ourselves one more question, 
And that really all depends on how much microplastic we throw out. It doesn't get into our ecosystem without us. Let me repeat that. Plastic does not get into our ecosystem without us. You know what? We're gonna be eating a lot more if we're not careful. All your comments are very much appreciated. Hit that subscribe button and thank you so much for watching this video.